songs about that had the Cape Town flavor. Obviously listen to my father's music and obviously that is where they got the inspiration. He was the biggest impact on Cape Town music. He's actually Cape Town music. So when he passed on obviously that died. So not a lot of people actually make that type of music anymore. a long and successful series of hit musicals. A gifted man who rose from humble beginnings to a giant in the South African and international music world. Talib was not only a beloved South African musician, he was a devoted father of four daughters and a son who lived with their mother, Madiha, and a young daughter, Zainab, who lived with him and his second wife, Najwa Dirk, and her two sons from a previous marriage. The couple look like they live the perfect life. But behind closed doors, a very different reality is unfolding. Talib and Najwa's marriage is slowly falling apart. Strange illnesses befall Najwa, and a searing jealousy for his children is emerging. I never bought into her being ill because there was this pattern. And when you try and, and look at the pattern and you try and you're busy sussing it out, then uh, you form your, your own conclusion because there was the recurrence of this illness was, was overwhelming. Talib was a creative person. And because of his trouble, marriage, it interfered with his creativity. Because he showed me his diary, he said to me, Mida, I want you to have a look at my diary. Look at the, li the life that I'm living. Look how my life it just became stagnant. And every page or second page would say, now you're sick again, now you're in bed again, now you're complaining about headaches. It, 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 it just went on and on. And, and then I said, oh, tell me, no, this is enough. Ahmad Najwa's son for me and said, your daddy was shot, come on by. It's just before Christmas 2006 when Talib's daughters receive a chilling call. Talib Peterson has been murdered, shot, execution style, in his fortified home. He has been found gagged and shot at point blank range in the back of his head, apparently by intruders. Driving there, it was like he's gonna survive. And then we got the blue lights flashing, and it's like, and it's... my dad, what happened? And you get there, and it's like, what's gonna happen now? And we started there, and they're like, and people are telling us, no, he's gonna survive, he's gonna survive. And all along, he was dead. So at three o'clock in the morning, they were like, he, he's dead. Your whole life Just... is gone. Your and whole you life is gone. Put this man that you put on a pedestal, on a cupboard, on a bed, and then on a pedestal <laughs> above that, being put into a black bag on the back of a van is the worst thing to go through in a couple of hours before that. He's like, I love you guys, I'll see you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And to have that phone call that say, your dad is not, he didn't make it. And your whole life just crumbles. You feel sick inside and the policeman said, if you want to go up to see your dad, you can. And I said to them, none of you go up there. We are not going to remember him like this. I asked the policeman to please open the door because I need to see my dad. And he says, no. And I'm like, yeah, I'm his son. I need to see my father. And I run through the house. And as I take the corner, I turn around and I just see blood all over the wall. And I just pause, I pause. And my uncle grabs me from the back of my collar. And he says, no, you're not ready. And um, the worst part about it was, I was the last person to find out that he died. Although his older children lived with their mother, they saw their beloved father often. The day he died, he took us to um, Canal Walk. And on the way there, he said, you know, Jawair, 
you are this to me and you make me so proud. Mm. And then when we left, he phoned each of he us and he wanted to speak to all of us and say, and he told me, Fatwa, I love you and I always love you and I'll always be there. And I'm like, yes, dad, I'm seeing yes. tomorrow. But heard. the weird part and of the phone call was that he said, whatever happens to me, just remember that our daddy will always love mm. you. The, the phone was on speaker and he told us to put it in the middle of the car so that everyone could hear. And he said that, just remember, whatever happens to daddy, I will always love you and I will always be praying and for you. And he's like, don't let anybody tell, tell you, you to shut up or don't let anybody oppress you because you are my child. And the last words he spoke to me was, um, Dad is proud of you and he loves you. And then he put the phone down. Evidence is collected early the next day. Witnesses are questioned. Rafik Sukar lives in the cottage on the property and knows the Petersons well. Talib would never have opened up the door if it was somebody unfamiliar to him because he's actually got a household policy here that he doesn't open up the door or he doesn't receive any visitors or he doesn't take any calls after 9 or 10 in the evening um, as a ruling. That's his personal private time. So this must have been somebody that he really knows. How did burglars get through the Petersons' elaborate security system? And why was only the helpless Talib killed and the others merely locked in their rooms? Is this more than a robbery gone wrong? The brutal murder of one of the country's most loved and talented playwrights and musicians rocks the community. As tributes to this legend of South African music pour in, suspicion between family and friends escalates. They say his wife, Najwa, is behaving as if nothing is wrong. She never spoke about his death. She never mourned about his death. She never shed a tear. She won't say the police taking a long time, Daddy. No, but well, that's enough to make you think. She will smile every day as nothing, no, nothing has happened. In the days that followed, police began to question Najwa, a woman prone to depression and who once stabbed her husband Talib in the neck. She was apparently upset when Talib visited his daughter Fatima in hospital because his ex-wife was in the room at the same time. When she stabbed him, she said, if I can't have you, nobody else will. His daughter, Juwahir, walked into the bedroom just after Najwa had stabbed her father and saw what she called a demonic look on Najwa's face as she held the bloody knife in her hand. After the stabbing, it had crossed my mind on more than one occasion that she would cause much more harm to him than stabbing him. Um, and I did try and, and tell my dad or warn him about it, but dad being dead, <laughs> yeah, did, I didn't get through. When he got stabbed in the neck, he didn't uh, much bother about it. He didn't make a case about it. He just left it be. He just left it be. He was at the stage in his life where the children came first. And yes, he also made a very big mistake by telling us in her presence how much the children, his children, means to him and how much he loves them. And yes, that he puts them first in his life. There's two differences in love and obsessed. She always used to tell me, uh, Daddy, I, I, I love Tully very much, but she was more obsessed than, than, than being in love with him. After the stabbing, um, things, instead of getting better, it became worse. Because A, like he told me, he, he slept in a separate bedroom and also he was not sexually uh, active with her anymore because he said to me, Mida, you know, the, the small little bit of passion that I had for her. When she stabbed me, uh, he said, it, it, it killed the passion. And also he said, he asked himself, why did she do it to him? Because he didn't deserve it. After the stabbing incident, his daughters from his first marriage were uncomfortable staying at the Grasmere Road home. It seems Talib was considering buying a house for them. What Najwa told me herself is that Talib gave all his money that he earned from all his work or shows. He gave all his money to her. That was like three months prior to his death. She said to me, but you know, Tuma, this time he didn't give me the check because he says there's something else he wants to do with it. And I think that is the, the money he wanted to use to buy the children the house. And she was very serious about money. 
he played, uh, you know, with, with the idea leaving or staying, leaving or staying. Also, there's this money business of his that he wanted to pull out. And he wanted to do it in such a way that it did not raise immediate concern. Because, yes, he did fear for his life. Yes, he told me that the Turks were ruthless when it comes to money and power. Six months have passed since Talib Peterson was found dead in the lounge of his Grasmere home. But now a man named Fahim Hendricks decides to spill the beans. What he tells police is shocking and sinister. He is named as the middleman between Najwa and three other men. The four are arrested and charged with murder. Accused number one, Najwa Peterson. Accused number two, Abdur Mjedi. Accused number three, Wahid Hassan. Accused number four, Jefferson Snyders. The tragic story has gone from botched robbery to murder for hire. A wife accused of murdering a man described by many as gentle, kind, and generous. Najwa applies for bail. It's tense outside the court. A family torn apart, Talib's on the one side, and the Dirks, Nadra's family, on the other. You can't say that she did it because she... Yes, so, so now I can judge at the moment. You can't say she did it. I won't hear anything, auntie, because she is my family, she's my cousin, and I will never stand on Just be careful. Just be careful. You're a Dirk, so I don't care what you is, but just be careful what you say. Finally, Najwa and her co-accused arrive at the Weinberg Magistrate's court to hear their bail application. It's a lengthy process, drawn out over several days. Both Talib and Najwa's families are in court. The prosecutor asserts that Najwa is a calculated killer and should be denied bail. Najwa pleads mental illness. It takes its toll on her family. Her father collapses in court. Finally, the verdict, bail is denied. Nadra's family is devastated. Her younger son, Sulaiman, breaks down and for the first time, Nadra shows emotion. Okay. It's just sad. It's just sad for so many people that has murder cases and murder cases that has been denied bail, I mean, has been approved bail. They are on the street. This is a mother. We just feel totally disturbed and sore and hurt to think on that facts. So no, man, we, we, we're not satisfied, but we have to accept. It's July 2008, and the trial begins at the Cape High Court. Both the Peterson and Dirk families are present. Najwa, accused number one, wears a new outfit every day and sits motionless throughout the entire trial. Fahim Hendricks is the state's key witness. He is not allowed to be filmed. Hendricks reveals how Nadra persistently called him in December 2006 to arrange a hit on her husband. She inquired from him whether he knew someone who could, and I quote, do a hit, close quotes, for her. He understood this to mean killing someone on her behalf. He approached accused number two for help in this regard. Abdur Mjedi informed Hendricks that he knew someone who could do the job. She asked that the job be done after the deceased returned from London and told Hendricks that she would telephonically advise him precisely when it could be done. She offered to pay them 100,000 rand, of which 30,000 rand would be available in the safe of the house. Talib returned from a London trip on the 14th of December. Najwa phoned Hendricks from Cape Town Airport she wanted him to arrange the hit that day and make it look like a hijacking. Hendricks phoned accused number two 
who told him that he was unable to get hold of the men who were to do the job. Nadja called again the following day. She asked him to arrange the hit at the Laksharama Theatre, where Talib was performing with his son Ashur for the first time. Hendrix called accused number two, and once again, he could not get hold of the men. Later that night, Nadja called again and said that Talib would be home early the following night, December 16. This time, everyone was available. The hit was on. According to accused number three, Wahid Hassan, Abdur Jedi contacted him and told him about a woman who wanted to have her husband killed. Hassan then recruited Jefferson Snyders, accused number four. He told Snyders that they had to stage a robbery so that the inhabitants could claim their loss from insurance. The security system was not in operation and the gate and door were open. The conclusion is inescapable that there was a Trojan horse in the Peterson household who facilitated the entry. It was suggested Nadra herself buzzed the assassins in. They grabbed the deceased and tied him up. While they were doing this, accused number one came out of the main bedroom. She appeared to be wide awake. Accused number four kicked the deceased because accused number three told him outside that the people in the house had agreed to be assaulted. Snyders, accused number four, then slaps Najwa, only to be told by Hassan that Najwa is actually assisting them. She shows them where the safe is and then gives them the money. He then asks for jewelry, watches and cell phones. She indicated the room where her son slept. Najwa's oldest son and Talib's stepson Ahmed, Ahmed's wife and their baby are in another room. They are told by a crying Najwa that the house is being robbed, but if everyone cooperates, no one will be injured. While Hassan robs them, Talib, lying on the floor of the lounge, cries and begs for his life. Snyders tells him he won't be killed and that it's just a robbery. He told the deceased that he did not intend to kick him so hard, that he was going to wipe the blood from his mouth and face. But then Hassan and Najwa return to the room and she asks that they shoot Talib. At that stage, the deceased asked him not to kill him because he has children, and that he told the deceased that no one was going to be killed. He stood up and asked number three what was going on, because he did not come here to have anyone killed. Snyders decides to leave the house, leaving Hassan to comply with Nadra's wishes. Talib repeatedly utters Allah Akbar, God is great, and recites the Kalima, a Muslim prayer. Hassan takes a pillow, folds it double, and puts the pistol inside. He told the kiss number one to shoot the deceased herself. She grabbed the gun, a shot went off, he locked the cues number one in her room, and left the house. It seems that either the cues number three or accused number one fired the fatal shot. The court cannot, however, come to any firm conclusion in this regard. After the trial, Nadra has to wait four months to hear her fate. Once again, the courtroom is packed with people eager to hear Judge Desai's verdict. Accused number one, was quite patently an appalling witness. Her evidence festers with lies. Her evidence of how the robbery started tends to show that she was cooperating with the robbers. It appears that Nadra's love of money is the prime factor motivating the murder. We know that accused number one, on her own version, loved money. We also know that the marriage relationship between the parties was strained since the stabbing incident. However, the evidence with regard to a divorce is not borne out by any other more objective evidence. The deceased seems to have treated the accused number one with great care and sympathy. Accused number one is found guilty on count one, the merger charge. After two days of impassivity, Najra finally shows remorse. 
Accused number one is sentenced to 28 years imprisonment. On the robbery charge, she's sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. The latter sentence is to run concurrently with the sentence imposed on count one. Effective sentence thus 28 years imprisonment. A long two-year wait finally over. A family trying to make sense of the events. And they begin a long process of healing. The turmoil, the emotional roller coaster wasn't for nothing. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who supported us throughout this entire two years. Thank you so much. It's about money and it's about selfishness. Because all he wanted was his freedom. I still feel the intensity of the, the rawness of the pain. And when I wake up in the morning, the first thing that hits me is to think he's gone. He will never come back. Yeah, we are still grappling. Grappling with this, his untimely death, with the senselessness of it all. I still cannot understand it. And sometimes it is so, like, so surreal. I, I sometimes still wish that I'm going to wake up and find that it was just an all a bad nightmare and that my brother is still here because he was the glue that kept all of us together and we've all been falling apart and we've got to try and be strong in fairness to, to Najwa. In the beginning, I must say that she was a very sweet person. Heaven knows what made her become what, so what evil. Went wrong? What went wrong? I really don't know. And, and you know, at first when Talib just got married to her, he said to me, Mida, this is the woman that I was waiting for all my life. This is the woman that I want to share whatever's left of my life. Yeah. But at the end, he was murdered. She can get all the years in jail. My dad's not going to come back. I'm going to have to live the rest of my life without him, which is actually quite difficult because her family can go visit her and see her and speak to her. I can't do that. I have to speak to my dad's tombstone. My little brother was 14 years old when he was murdered. Oh, my God. 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 He just stopped in high school. He matriculated. He's put the show together. He plays any instrument under the sun. Yes, his room is never clean. Oh. It's been seven years since Talib Peterson was brutally gunned down in his own home. Ashur Peterson, Talib's only son, is now 21. He finds solace in his music and is reviving his father's first love, local Cape music. Like Father Ashur is basically a journey that I had with my father. It's kind of a timeline. So I explain the journey I had with him. Then the second half will be a, more about him Then it's kind of introducing where I'm going. Then it introduces my life at the end. He wasn't here to, to, to see me graduate with Rick. He wasn't here to see me write my first song. But what I can be proud of is that I am like father, like son. And then after that happens, he starts singing Possible Dream. And then people obviously get to see him perform again.